Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Ruru Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Molina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Kosmo. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 218 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Kosmo, and I'm joined, as always, by the infamous, the elusive, Mr. Ayaz Sumra. Ayaz, how's it going? I'm good, Joe. Yourself? Very good, my friend. Well, not very good, to be honest. I'm uh, pretty pretty ill, actually. Battling a bit of a throat infection at the minute, so hopefully the show goes by pretty quickly. Um, let's start. That's a bit of a bleak way to start it. We, we're going to try and step it up. Try, try and step up the positivity. We're going to start here. <clears throat> Clear my throat. Think positive. The Pabellon de la Val de Hebron in Barcelona, Catalonia, Spain. Still managed to break out the accent there. Um, top in the bill, Sandor Martin. Um, probably one of the best Spanish fighters, actually. Um, 36 and 2 now. He was able to unanimously, over 12 rounds, beat our very own Joe Hughes. Both men were former European champions. Uh, Martin, I think, was the reigning champion. Anyway, it was for the EBU belt. Both men have held it at some stage, and um, both men lost to Anthony Yidget. I really thought that Joe Hughes would probably be a you know, a level above this guy here. I believe that Joe Hughes is a fantastic fighter, but he lost very wide on the cards. Two judges actually had it 11 rounds to one. Um, also on that bill, the Spanish slayer, I'm calling him now, David Avanesia, now 26 and 3 with a draw. A knockout for him in the very first round against Jose Del Rio, now 29 and 9 with a draw. That one was for the EBU European welterweight title. Uh, David Avanesian loves going to Spain and laying down the pain. Moving out now to the Manez in Vladikazkaz in Russia. Um, one fight to mention over here. Another fight which I thought would be a you know a decent fight, a competitive fight. I was completely wrong. Fedor Chudinov now twenty two and two, a unanimous decision win for him over Hassan and Dam now thirty seven and five. He pretty much shut him out actually. Um, Chudinov managed to win. 12 rounds to zero on two cards, and um, I think 11 rounds to to uh, to one on the other card. So very, very wide there. Um, very, very shocked, actually. I thought, like, uh, in my opinion, I felt like um, Trudinov would, you know, would, would, would have good moments. But I felt like Hassan and Dam, I know he's coming off a few bad performances, obviously, the, the slaughtering he got against Callum Smith. But Fedor Trudinov, not really a Callum Smith caliber type of fighter. So for me, I felt like Hassan and Dan would have some success, but absolutely not. Um, moving out now to the Planet Ice in Altrincham, Cheshire, United Kingdom. This one was a um, a ultimate boxer show. Um, I watched it. It was on... It was, on, um... it was BT Sport. Yeah, so I watched it. I watched it. Um... Interesting, actually, really interesting. Because when I looked at the, the the lineup, obviously it was the heavyweights that were getting it on. When I looked at the lineup, I was a little bit underwhelmed, and the reason why is because a couple of the guys on the bill had boxed each other before. Um, obviously, Nick Webb got stopped by Camille Sokolowski. Um, so, in my opinion, I was thinking, oh, if those guys end up drawing each other, then we should probably expect to see the same kind of fight. But anyway, it wasn't like that at all. Um, in the end, Nick Webb ended up winning it. Friend of the show, Nick Webb, now 16, and I think he's now 16-2 and two after the whole thing. It was quite confusing because, obviously, you know, he won the quarterfinal, the semifinal, and then the final. And he did really well, actually, Nick Webb. Um, Camille Sokolowski crashed out in the first round against Josh Sandland. That was quite an upset, in my opinion, there. Uh, Jonathan Palata, a heavyweight prospect. I think he's now moved to the Peacock gym. He was obviously with Don Charles before. He he lost in the first round as well to Danny Whittaker, who was only 2-1, and one, I believe. 
So um, that was quite an upset loss there. Um, Mark Bennett did well. Um, Chris Healy, you know, he he was in there as well. Obviously lost to Nick Webb, a split decision. There was a couple of split decisions um, to, to, to really think about it. When you actually sit back and look, there was one knockout in all the fights, you know. They're heavyweights. There was a knockout bonus on the line. I thought there was going to be knockouts in every fight. It wasn't quite that. It was a little bit more tactical than what we expect, usually over three rounds. But the rightful winner, um, Nick Webb, he gets a chance to get his career back on track. I'm pleased for him. Moving out now to the Fantasy Springs Casino in Indio, California, USA. Virgil Ortiz Jr., arguably the best prospect in world boxing. I think he's now 15 and 0 with 15 KOs. He was able to knock out Brad Solomon in five rounds. Brad Solomon never been stopped. Only had the one loss. Now 28 and 2, though. He was down in the, in the fourth round and twice in the fifth and final round. Brilliant win there for Virgil Ortiz Jr. Uh, moving out now to the Collar Drummer in Plovdiv, Bulgaria. Area. Over here, Tavel Pulev now 15 and 0, a unanimous decision over 12 rounds against Deshaun Webster. That one was for the vacant WBA International Cruiserweight title. On the undercard, former Kubrat Pulev opponent Bogdan Dino, he picked up a win now 19 and 2. The Romanian was able to TKO Osborne Machimana, who had a record of 23 and 13 with two draws going in. Four, four rounds. Um, it took there for Dinu to dispatch Mr. Osborne Machimana. I like that name there. Moving out now to Germany at the Congress Centrum in Oberhausen. Um, over here, friend of the show, heavyweight, I want to say contender, but I don't think I can call him a contender. I want to say prospect, but he's certainly not that. Mark Damori, definitely one in the mix, um, you know, a fantastic record. Now 38-2 and two with two draws. Obviously a bit padded. A KO for him in two rounds against the real overmatched Laszlo Sazin, who's now 6-39, uh, and 39, his record there. So a, a KO there for Mark Demore in two. Moving out now to the Brentwood Centre in Brentwood, Essex. This one was on Sky Sports. Um, I watched this one as well. Um, on the undercard, because it was this, it was the uh, the golden contract thing again. It was obviously over ten rounds. Couple of upsets, really. Um, firstly, not actually part of that tournament, but also on the same bill, over ten rounds. Dan Aziz was able to move to eleven and zero. Unanimous decision for him over ten rounds against Lawrence Suzuki, who loses his own now nine and one with a draw. That one was for the vacant English light heavyweight title. Um, and now getting onto the actual tournament itself, Andre Sterling. He was beat by Liam Conroy. Um, I actually backed Liam Conroy to win on points. Obviously not on the prediction league because we didn't do it. And we haven't done it again this week. We've been a little bit slacking lately um, over this festive kind of period. Getting ready for Christmas. Getting ready to get lazy. But don't worry, we won't be stopping the podcast. We'll still get, I still get pumped out every week. We never take a week off. Um, Andre Sterling, though, yeah, he, he lost. Now 10-2. and two. It was a unanimous decision over 10 in favour of Liam Conroy. Sterling was on the canvas in round 7. Very tough fight to Sterling, but I feel like he's found his level now with the loss to, to Craig Richards in, in what was a good fight, and then of course to Liam Conroy, it's been a been been a bit of a bad 2019 I suppose for Andre Sterling, also on the bill, Stephen Ward, he was um, he was TKO'd in the first round by Ricard Spolotniks, who a lot of people were looking at as the weak link of the tournament, Stephen Ward loses his O, that one was also for the, for the WBO, European light heavyweight title, three times he was down there, Stephen Ward, unbelievable for Bolotniks and um, Bob Adjasaf now 19 and 4 he lost unanimously over 10 rounds to Jose Burton obviously Jose Burton was going to be the favourite all day long um, it was great to see that fight in the first round because you know the first round of the tournament because obviously both men were former British champions and Remember, no one wanted to pick Jose Burton as their opponent, and Bob Adjasaf being fourth in line to make his pick had absolutely no other choice. So the fight that um, was probably the highest kind of competitive level, if you like, um, we got to see in the first round. Both men, former British champions, like I say, Adjasaf was actually down in the first round. It was like six seconds after the first bell. He was on the canvas. Shocking there. Um, I'm not sure he's ever been down before, Bob Adjasaf. But anyway, Jose Burton ended up going the distance with him quite wide in the end on the cards there, and rightly so. Um, also, the other the other fight in that tournament, Tommy Philbin now 
now um, 13 and one again. He lost his O, so a few people losing their O's on this on this in, on this card here at the Brentwood Centre. Um, Serge Michel, the opponent, he was able to get the win. He's now 10 and one, so it makes it quite interesting. Obviously, Serge Michel, Liam Conroy, Jose Burton, and Ricard Belotnik through to the next round again. Jose Burton for me, the clear favourite to go on to win the whole thing. Moving out now to the York Hall in Bethnal Green, London. Couple fights to mention pretty quickly here. Umar Sadiq, now 9-1. and one. His opponent, Danny Shannon, retired after seven rounds. He didn't come out for the eighth and final round. He's now 6-8 and eight with a draw. I think it was a shoulder injury, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Harley Ben returned to the ring. He's now 7-1. and one. It was a points win for him over four rounds against MJ Hall, now 2-48 and 48 with two draws. Johnny Garton, the former British champion, he returned as well, 24-2 and two with a draw now. Um, a points win for him over six rounds against Jordan Granham. Uh, moving out now to the MSG New York USA, the final bill to mention um, over here. Let's start with the undercard. Um, Michael Conlon was able to get his revenge finally against Vladimir Nikitin. Uh, credit to Nikitin for fighting Conlon so early. You know, since he's turned pro, he's only 3-0 and Nikitin. It's been a bit stop-start for him, and he took on Conlon. I wouldn't have imagined that the money would have been fantastic, but he took it, and um, he had a few moments here and there, but Conlon got it on the cards really wide, especially from the card uh, Bernard Bruni. This this judge gave it 10 rounds to zero in favour of Conlon. He's now 13-0. and oh, He was definitely the rightful winner. That one was for the WBO Intercontinental featherweight title. Nikitin now 3-1. and one. Perhaps we'll see the end of those um, those middle finger poses. Perhaps not. It, it seems like a bit of a trend. Um, George Cambosos Jr., the former well, I say former sparring partner of Manny Pacquiao. I think they still get it on in the gym when they when they got the time. Um, he's now 18-0, and 0, friend of the show. He was able to beat Mickey Bay on a split decision over 10 rounds. Hopefully we get Mickey Bay on the show a little bit later. I'm hoping that we can do that. Um, Mickey Bay was down in the final round, the 10th round, and it proved to be quite... Um, quite a interesting point because it ended up being a split decision. Like I say, one judge gave it to Mickey Bay by a point. Um, the other judge gave it to George Cambosos by three, which of course, um, you know, which of course includes that 10 8 round in the final round. And then the other judge, Mark Constantino, had it quite wide to Cambosos Jr. He had it to him by five points in the end. Um, so, yeah. I'll definitely ask Mickey Bay about that. Should he come on the show? Also on the bill, Terence Crawford now 36 and now a TKO for him in the ninth round against Igis Kavalowskis. That one was for Crawford's WBO World Welterweight title. Kavalowskis was actually down in the seventh round and then he was down twice in the ninth round where he was TKO'd. Like I say, it was the final round for him. Um... It was a it was a decent fight actually. I felt like Kavalowskis had the good the good tactics, probably the better tactics of the two early on in the fight. Uh, from the from the third round, I think it was that was where Crawford he got dropped, but it was it was ruled a slip. You know the the, the referee didn't score it a knockdown. The replay showed I think that it definitely should have been called a knockdown. But um, to, to Crawford's credit, he got back up and he finished a round really strong. You know, he, he he reacted aggressively. We know he's a ballsy fighter. He's got a lot of pride. The fourth round, I felt like Crawford, you know, went straight out on the hunt, straight out on the front foot. There was a bit of desperation in his work. Not quite sure why, because, of course, he would have known it wasn't ruled a knockdown, so it wasn't a 10-8 round. And... Um, you know, he was setting a high tempo, but he was risking a lot. You know, he got caught a few times and he was giving Kavalowskis a chance because he wasn't boxing. He was just simply in there to trade. Uh, round seven, that was where Crawford, like I say, got the knockdown. Kavalowskis looked a little bit like he was getting beaten up. He didn't seem like he had too much left in the tank. I don't think he'd been over 10 rounds before. So, um, you, you know, straight away I was thinking he's he's probably not going to last the, the 11th and 12th round. Um, Crawford, you know, turning it into a bit of a dogfight, putting on a show. Round eight, it was all Crawford, but, you know, nothing telling was really landed from either guy. But for me, Crawford dominated it. Kavalaskis went back to his corner, and I just noticed he looked like he was feeling sorry for himself a bit. And then, like I say, the ninth round, he was dropped, and he got back up. Got dropped again pretty quickly after that, and the referee waved it off. So, for me, um, just want to go on a very quick 30-second rant. 
you know, there's a lot of people on Twitter. It's been a topic lately. Who should be ranked higher on the pound for pound list, Crawford or Spence? I can't believe this is actually an argument. Um, Terence Crawford, a champion at lightweight, an undisputed champion at 140. Then he's moved up to welterweight, where a lot of people felt like he might be giving up his size advantages that he had at lightweight and and super lightweight. He's up at welterweight against bigger guys than he's used to used to fight him, and he's four and zero with four KOs. You know, three of the, the the fighters that he's boxed were undefeated, and the other one was Amir Khan. You know, so he's been in he's been in some good fights, and he's been impressing. Like I say, four and zero, four KOs. I don't know the last time he's he's had four knockouts in a row, so um, that is uh, you know a, a statement there from from Crawford once again. But um, for what he's done at lightweight and super lightweight, especially that's enough to rank him above Spence. Forget him even moving up to one four seven. If he was still the guy that held all four belts at one forty, he'd be above Spence. But the fact he's moved up, that's his. Uh, his sixth world title now, that WBO World to Weight title, is his sixth world title. Errol Spence hasn't even proved that he's the best fighter at 147 yet. Crawford's already done it, especially at 140. But at lightweight, he was the best lightweight in the world when he was fighting at that weight, in my opinion. And in, in everyone's opinion, really. Um, he was big for the weight, huge for the weight. And like I say, dominated at 140. Now he's at 147. He's got an argument for being the best there. I do want to see the fight. I hope the fight happens. But... If anyone's rating Spence above Crawford on their pound for pound list, then ooh, give your head a wobble, I think. That's my that's my opinion there. Um and moving up the card once again, this one was a real shock for me. I felt like um I felt like Richard Comey, the, the champion at the time of the fight, now twenty nine and three. I felt like he would pose some real questions of the young um cocky um super confident Tiafimo Lopez but he really didn't you know Comey as I said his two losses were really controversial on split decisions in his opponent's backyards Tiafimo Lopez showed up and he was sensational I felt like in the first round Lopez won it you know he was on the front foot for the whole round there was more variety in his work he outworked Comey he caught him nice with both hands as well and Comey got through with one or two nice shots but both men you know, when they were jabbing, um, Tiafimo, I felt, would would get the better of the jabs and the power punches. So, for me, Tiafimo won that round there. A lot of people were saying that Comey won it. I can't understand how you can give him that round. And then, of course, the second and final round, he just proved he's the real deal. You know, I couldn't believe it. The pair were trading left hooks, and I think Comey seemed to come off worse on his one. And then Lopez caught him again with the right hand, and Comey got dropped. You know, he got back up. He fell straight back down. You know, it was a double knockdown with... Uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> not not when two guys hit each other at the same time and they both got down. He got dropped, got back up again and got dropped again. I remember, um, I think Mike Tyson dropped Burbick in similar fashion or was Burbick down three times. Anyway, he, he was allowed by the referee to continue. And to be honest, he did look okay on the eye. But, um, you know, he was straight on the retreat and Lopez went on the hunt and he was hitting him with big hooks, both left and rights. And, um, you know, Comey wasn't wasn't really firing back at all and he was taking them to his credit but he just wasn't firing back and too many unanswered punches in a row after being down twice from one punch that was enough for the referee to jump in it was a cautious stoppage but it was the right one in my honest opinion and like I say I've been saying before um, there's no rush for Tiafimo Lopez he's still young I think he's only just turned 22 a few months ago so there's no rush for him but he wants to he wants to be in a rush and I'm not going to you know, I'm not going to get in the way of that at all. You know, if he's if he's good enough, then why not? So he, um, I think he's now the youngest active world champion, or is David Benavidez still the youngest? I'm not sure, but you know, him and um, Javante Davis, that's the fight I'd love to see down the line. Um, but for now, Tiafimo Lopez is the real deal. Everyone knows that now. He's announced it on the world stage. No one has ever done that to Richard Comey before, and um, it's another world champion for the podcast because he's been on a couple of times. We'll hopefully get him on at some point in 2020. Um, so yeah, 15 and 0 now. Tiafimo Lopez is calling on Lomachenko. Is it too soon? To be honest, I thought it was before, but after that, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Tiafimo Lopez um, obviously won the fight in front of Lomachenko. Lomachenko was in the crowd and. Lomachenko definitely wouldn't have done that to Comey in two rounds. So I know styles make fights and that, and, you know, Lomachenko's 
Lomachenko's fighting isn't all about power. Neither's, neither's Lopez, but Lopez is clearly the, the heavier handed of the two. If the fight happens, I'm actually all for that fight now. Based on that showing, he is ready. Even at the ripe young age of 22, he seems to have it all. You know, he's got the charisma, the character, um, the fighting style, the, the celebrations afterwards. He is, in my opinion, a future pay per view star, perhaps. And um, America need that right now, to be honest. Um, all the best, though, to Tiafimo Lopez and. Everyone else that we've mentioned in the review part of the show. Uh, That is it, though, for part one. Just before we wrap up part one, though, the last thing to do before we end part one is to welcome our very first guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the heavyweight ultimate boxer winner, Nick Webb. Nick, welcome back on the show. Hello, hello, hello. You good? All good, my friend. It's been a long time. Like I say, we we last did an interview. I think it was about three and a half years ago. It was... uh, it was it was a long time ago. Oh. Ever since then, though, I've kept your number, kept myself and our listeners up to date on your career. Obviously, there's been a couple of bumps, yeah. but let's get into it. I do want to discuss yeah. each of the three fights you had on the weekend. But firstly, how important is winning a tournament like this at this stage of your career, Nick? Yeah, I think, you know, I was at a, a bit of a crossroads where, you know, I had a few mishaps for, you know, um, some, uh, you know, because I had injuries and whatever, and then, yeah, I had a few mishaps and, you know, I got beaten in the, in the fights, got caught with a shot. Um, so I was I was at a stage where it was hard to get fights and, you know, to make money out of this, this sport. So, it was, you know, I was looking hard to carry on if I wanted to. So this has given me the, the much needed wins I needed to be able to carry, carry my own dreams on. And like I say, I mean, last time we spoke, you were undefeated. You'd just gone the distance, if I remember correctly, for the first time in your career. It was on the uh, the Hay Arnold the Cobra undercard. Uh, I think uh, I think you were six and zero uh, with with five KOs. Um, obviously, uh, Harry Miles, yeah, Harry it, Miles, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, so a yeah. long time ago. But but you know, the the Dave Allen fight. I'm not. This is old news now, really. But I mean, what, what seemed yeah. to go wrong? Because I'm I've got to be honest. I fancied you big time in that fight. Well, what happened leading to the fight, uh, February, uh, what was it, about five, five months before the fight, uh, I fell over while running in Germany, slipped on some ice, and um, I dislocated my clavicle and, yeah, separated my, my um, tendons and ligaments from my shoulder, uh, and I had to have major surgery. Um, and then, yeah, obviously, I went through a lot of rehab and, trying to get back and I think I just rushed to get back too soon like I didn't have the strength there in my arm but I believed in myself so and we got offered the fight with Alan and yeah it was what it was worth the risk and yeah we gambled and yeah the gamble didn't pay off I mean obviously you got the win after that against Dorian Darch and then straight back in with Sokolowski and I was a little bit shocked to see him go out of the tournament the other night by the way in the first fight because you know, I know how dangerous yeah. he can be. Obviously, so do you. Fair play yeah. to Josh Sandlin for beating him. But that loss to Sokolowski, because you yeah. touched on it there. There was there was a period where, before this tournament come about, you were, you know, a little bit down, dare I say. You know, you weren't yeah. too sure what you were going to do next. Um, losing to Sokolowski, was that hard to take? Because, again, he is a lot better than his record suggests, but he's still got that losing record on paper, you know? Yeah, well, really what happened after the Dave Allen fight, Obviously, I was undefeated the fight before that, so losing that actual fight really mentally, um, you know, caused me a lot of problems. Um, you know, the self belief and things like that. And I took the Dorian Darts fight. I won it, but it was like going through the motion sort of thing. I I won it, but you know, I still didn't believe, and I and I couldn't get my mind right. And then a few things happened um, before the uh, before the Camille fight. And I just didn't, yeah, I just didn't have, uh, I wasn't mentally there. And, yeah, he came in and he beat me. And that, yeah, and then after getting beaten then as well, I was, I was even more damaged. It took me a while to build my self-confidence back. Just quickly, the, the Dorian Darch fight, that was at the, uh, where was that again? I'm sure I was there for that one. In Bracknell, yeah, in Bracknell. I was there for that one, yeah, 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 yeah. Didn't Sokolowski also fight on that card? 
Yeah, he he built he, he beat, beat um, my um, stable mate Nick and Naylor. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. I was there for that one. Wow. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you say that you yeah. know, obviously after losing to Sokolowski, it was it was a, it was you know it was dark times, and unbelievably, you take yeah. a year out of the ring, almost exactly to the day, yeah. you're back in this tournament here. Wait a minute, Camille Sokolowski's in the tournament as well. In some ways, it almost looked a little bit like a kamikaze style move. You managed to pull it off though. Let's start with the first fight, Chris Healy. Yeah, um, that was that was obviously the quarterfinal fight. Tell me about that one because obviously you knew him. You boxed him in 2017. Um, yeah, I just so I drew him, and I knew he was going to bring his A game. I thought right, he's going to be coming for blood. Um, but you know, I know he's not really a puncher. He's more of a, a boxer type, uh, awkward southpaw. So yeah, I just you know I, I knew from my previous fight, I knew I outboxed him as well. So I knew I could sort of do both, and and I knocked him out before. So I, I thought, you know, well, I want to knock him out again. But to be fair to him, he um, he boxed well. He avoided the knockout. Um, but I still believe I, I've watched it back a few times. And I still believe I won every round. So I, I, I didn't really get hit and he was getting damaged. Yeah, because throughout the night itself, there was a few split decisions. And every time it happened, because obviously three yeah. rounds, it's so, you know, it could go either way. It's so it's so hard to kind of score yeah. it decisively. Was it worrying when you when you heard that there was going to be a split? Yeah, like obviously before the third round started, after uh, my my coach Scott said to me, um, you know, you, I, he said this could be close. You need to you need to put it on him in this way. You need to stop him. I was like, really? I was like, all right. So I sort of you know got on my toes a bit more and up the pressure. And yeah, and then come to the end, thought yeah, you know, I definitely won that round. I thought I've you know I won it, and then when I heard that it was going to be a split decision, I was like, what? I sort of, yeah, panicked, had a quick panic. Yeah. I couldn't believe it, yeah. But then when they called me the win, I was like, whoa, yeah, good. <laughs> and obviously you went into the semi finals against Danny Whitaker, and that was an interesting one because yeah. he'd just beaten Jonathan Palata. And uh, deep down, I thought yeah. Palata would do well because, I mean, I'm not saying I thought he'd win the whole thing, but yeah. I thought he'd do well. And uh, you, you end up knocking, knocking uh, Whitaker out in a round. <laughs> Yeah, that was really interesting. Um, you know, I thought I thought I'd probably uh, have Palata in the, in the in that round. Yeah. Um, you know, I was thinking more that I would have him. I was thinking, you know, Danny Whitaker was you know a wild card. I thought, you know, this is boxing. You don't know what can happen. I thought he could maybe, but it was more likely to be uh, to be Palata. So you know, I was thinking about him more. And then when he came out, I was like, oh, okay. It's interesting. I've been, you know, he's not much on him, so I couldn't really study him so well. Um, and obviously, you you fight each fight as you go. So me beating Chris Ely, I wasn't looking past Chris Ely. I was just doing him, won that, and then yeah. So then Danny Whitaker got in there, and yeah, I just felt him out. I just, you know, I used my experience. I blocked most of his shots, and uh, yeah, and then he just. He was in close, and he just he just went down from a left hook. He's one of them. It's one of them when you're not trying to go for the shots, and you and you just catch him with something, and it just can. Yeah, I know them ones. I do them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> What's it like, Nick, in between fights? I mean, do you race back to the dressing room quickly to watch the next fights? What's it like in the, in the time before fights? Yeah, you, what you're trying to do, you're really trying to. Um, you know, not expel as much energy. You're trying to relax as much as you can because you know if you're if you're getting nervous and up and down, you're wasting energy. So I get to the change of rooms and just like straight lay down and just try listening to some music and chill out and sort of get ready for the next one. But but each time you're warming up, you're taking that energy out of you. So yeah, but no, it was good. I uh, I enjoyed the tournament and. Um, yeah, warming up and warming down was, was was different, very interesting. So you were listening to music and watching the the fights? No, I didn't watch the fights. No, really? I didn't. So, um, just literally so someone, went down, some, closed my eyes. Someone must have told you who you were fighting, though, in the next rounds, though, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, someone told me. Um, I think uh, I had to go for an interview, that was it. Um, I was resting, but then I had to go for an interview, and while I went for an interview, um, that's when Danny pulled off. Pulled out that win. 
Oh man, that was funny because I thought you were saying you just go there, shut your eyes, and then it's a surprise when you're in the ring. Whoever walks out. <laughs> oh, no, no. Yeah, no, they get told. <laughs> but in the final, Nick, obviously Mark Bennett, he had a he had an absolute cracker of a fight in the semis with Josh Sandland. <laughs> um, you were able yeah. to shut him out uh, over over yeah. over over the three yeah. rounds on all three judges' scorecards. How difficult or easy was it to get that win? Because like I say, he was in a water fight before. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, I think he had quite a bit taken out of him. Um, but I knew if I just boxed him, because um, I know he's the brawler type. So if you go into a brawler, brawl fight with a brawler, you know, I'm playing to his strengths. And and even though I would have loved to have done that because I love a brawl, um, I just, you know, it's more important to get the win. So um, I knew if I just used my jab, and, and good footwork, I, I could beat him because I sort of studied him a little bit. I knew he was right-hand happy and he was the sort of, yeah, brawler-type kind of man. So I knew if I boxed him and used good footwork, I could um, I could get the win, and it, you know, without taking too much out of myself. And like I say, I mean, winning this tournament for you, I believe, has come at a perfect time. It's, it's what your career needed. Um, Dave Allen, who was kind of, I think, in semi-retirement, posted something about wanting to, to, to do a rematch. But right now, you know, you're the man with a golden robe. What do you want to do next, Nick? You know, I, yeah, I see him, and it's actually good to see him. You know, like, he's beating me, and, you know, he derailed my career. So seeing him sort of fired me up, not like, Thinking, you know, I like him. He's a nice kid, and and I'm getting well with him when I see him. But like, he sort of fired me up when I saw him before the other fights, and I was like, oh, that's good. <laughs> and um, yeah, so if yeah, if he wants a rematch, I'd definitely be well happy to uh, avenge my loss. Uh, that's something on the cards that we can look at definitely. And I'm asking this question to everyone in the month of December, Nick. What's on your Christmas wish list for 2020 in terms of your career? Where where can you be or where do you want to be this time next year? You know, this time next year, I want a belt around me. Um, yeah, I want to be back where I, I should be. And I believe I deserve, you know. I want to have a belt and my career up and up and up. For sure. And just finally, Nick, just before I let you go, if you've got any closing words, anything at all you'd like to say to our listeners, just before we let you go, say whatever you like. The floor is yours. Uh, I'd just like to say um, thank you for everyone that has believed in me. Um, I'm still here and I'm still, um, and I think I proved the other day that, you know, I, I still got what it takes. So uh, keep believing in me and I will be there. For sure. Listen, Nick, I'm really, really pleased for you. Like I say, it hasn't been an easy ride coming off the year layoff, coming back to win that tournament in good style. I'm really proud of you, my friend. It's been great speaking with you once again. Enjoy Christmas. Have a great new year, and I'm sure we'll definitely catch up in 2020, brother. Wicked. I hope everyone enjoys a lovely Christmas. That's what it's all about. Family time now. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part of the show. I ask what you got. Saul Canelo Alvarez has vacated his WBO light heavyweight championship. Yeah, I can't really say I'm surprised. Um, you know, the win against Kovalev was an excellent win. It was certainly one for the legacy. Um, but hanging around at that weight where he's given away such, such, you know, such disadvantages. Is that the right word? Or giving away advantages to the op- opponents he'd end up fighting? I don't know. Anyway, but Turby Evan, guys like that, are, are fights that he doesn't need to take, you know. We'd all love to see them, of course, because they've all got a chance of beating him, but, you know, sensibly, he's, he's decided to vacate, which means he'll he'll go back down, whether that's going to be to middleweight or super middleweight. It's yet to be seen. I think it's probably going to be super middleweight, and um, you know, I'm not too surprised by that, and uh, it's obviously big news because he's he's you know the biggest name in the sport. But yeah, not not a surprise really. Yep, Cash Farouk has signed to Matchroom Boxing. Yeah, Cash Farouk obviously was in a great fight. Um, I think it was just about a month ago, maybe a little bit longer, a little bit less um, against against Lee McGregor. Obviously, you know both men were based in Scotland, are still based in Scotland, and Cash Farouk ended up on the wrong end of a decision. But a lot of people felt it could have gone either way. I think Eddie Hearn watched the fight, decided that Cash Farouk, in his opinion, should have got the nod, and on the back of that, he was interested in him and he signed him. So I'm pleased for Cash Farouk. Obviously. 
obviously, uh, you know, being with Matram is going to surely push him on. And, um, yeah, just pleased for him personally. Don't know the guy, but wish him all the best. Okay, uh, the big news is that Tyson Fury has split with Ben Davidson and will now be trained by Jamin Sugar Hill, uh, who's the nephew of Emmanuel Stewart. Yeah, very, very strange move. I mean, I was absolutely gobsmacked when I saw that Ben Davidson had, you know, essentially got the sack. I think both men have decided to split. It's very amicable. It's very respectful. Um, but I'm just, I'm just completely shocked because it's only a couple of months away from the rematch. And, you know, people say Ben did a great job helping Tyson lose all that weight. Yes, he did. He was a great motivator. But... You know, he got that job being a young man. I think he was 25 when he first started working with Tyson Fury. He's only about 26, 27 now, something like that. And, um, you know, he's proved himself, actually. And when we first heard that Tyson Fury linked up with him, a lot of people were very sceptical. I, myself, was one of them. I was told by certain people that he is, you know, completely useless. We saw him, obviously, in the corner for one of Billy Joe's fights. He didn't do a great job that night. He come under a lot of stick. And he's proved himself, though, on the on the biggest stage, you know. Obviously, that, that Deontay Wilder fight in which Tyson Fury should have got the nod. We know that Ricky Hatton and Freddie Roach also played a, a, a part in the corner. Perhaps that was a sign there that Tyson Fury needs something more than just Ben on, on a big fight night. And he, he did that for the first Wilder fight. Obviously, Ben was in the corner for the two other fights that Fury had on the comeback trial, um, you know, against... Sefer Sefery and guys like that and you know whenever the big fights come around he seems like he needs more than just Ben so that's probably why he's doing it but it's a funny move because you know Sugar Hill's not under like you know under what's the word I'm trying to use here he's not like there's not loads and loads of people queuing up to to get him to train with him I don't think so it's a weird one and um, I feel sorry for Ben a little bit because he's done such a great job and like I say he's really proved his credentials on the highest on the highest level and more than that they had a special bond you know it was a healthy bond it was a good bond it was positive and it's a shame really that we're not going to see him in the corner so hopefully they link up again sometime in the future but it's it's, it's a shame really because it's so close to the fight you know and um Ben knows exactly what Tyson has to do to win the fight and I think Tyson knows that so like I say very very much caught me off guard as it did everyone else actually Chris Eubanks uh, Jr.'s IB, IBO super middleweight belt has now been declared vacant by the IBL. Yeah, they stripped him of it. Um, I don't know why everyone keeps saying it's been made vacant. I mean, that, that basically means they stripped him. Basically, he fought for the interim WBA world title against Matty Korobov. And because he's now the interim WBA champion, the IBO stripped him. So that's pretty much that. It's, that's the short of it, really. Um, also, Tommy Fury has revealed that he split with trainer Ricky Hatton. Wow, I didn't know that. And I was actually at the open workout earlier this week at the Lakeside Shopping Centre. Um, myself and Michael Hunter took a trip down there, um, down the motorway down there, caught in a bit of traffic. But we got there in time to see Tommy Fury. We got there in time to see um, Daniel Dubois and the rest of it. But, um, yeah, I didn't know that at all. I didn't see Ricky in the ring, but... I saw John Fury. I didn't really think any, uh, any, any, anything of it to be honest. But that's quite surprising. Um, he, he's also insisted that he's getting trained by his father, John Fury. Okay, I mean, like I say, he's at that stage of his career, Tommy, where he's only fighting knockover jobs at the minute. Um, off the back of his Love Island success and stuff like that, I'm sure they're going to really build him up. You know, they're in no rush whatsoever with him. He's still a young guy. Um, he's a star already, and there's no need to put him in any risky fights at this stage of his career at all. So his first 15 or so fights, I'd imagine, are all going to be against no-hopers. It's just the way their business is. You know, it's a business more than a sport. And... Um, his dad was a former pro fighter, so he knows enough to get him through. In fact, I probably know enough to get him through these these fights he's going to be having. It's going to be against guys that he's going to beat easy. And, um, you know, that's just what happens in boxing. We can't be mad at that. That's just the game. I understand that. And best of luck to him. Um, I like I like the whole Fury family, to be honest. They're, they're all good guys. Um, Mikey Garcia has signed with Matrim Boxing and has announced that he will fight uh, Jesse Vargas in the uh, in a World War fight. On February the 29th, February 29th. at the Ford Center in Frisco. Yeah, Feb- February 29th. Um, it's, 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 you know, pretty much the worst kept secret. We all knew that 
Um, we, you know, we all heard the rumors and stuff like that that the fight would be taking place at welterweight between Mikey Garcia and Jesse Vargas. Um, interesting to see Mikey staying at one four seven, obviously following his loss to Errol Spence in the fashion that he lost. Um, there's no real need for him to stick around there. It's not like Jesse Vargas has got a belt. I think he's better suited to lightweight or 140 Mikey Garcia. So it's it's kind of weird to see him still staying there for a fight like this as well. But I'm, I'm I'm told that he was given you know a real big offer and stuff like that. It's a one fight deal, I believe, with Eddie Hearn. So best of luck to him. Obviously, Mikey Garcia, good friend of the show, and um, yeah, I wish him all the best against Jesse Vargas February 29th. Yep, and that's it for the news. Okay, thank you very much, Ayaz. Just before we get on to the preview part of the show, there is one fight card that we missed because it took place yesterday, the Wednesday, um, in the Brisbane Convention and Exhibition Centre in South Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. Um, it was the rematch between Jeff Horn, the former world champion, now now 20-2 and two with a draw. Michael Zarafa, obviously, his opponent, um, 27 and 3 going in now 27 and 4 because he was able to avenge the loss Jeff Horn um, obviously the first fight that we saw was was quite a shock actually I felt like Jeff Horn would be too much for Zarafa um, Zarafa really showed up though I think he was just coming off that loss at the time to Kel Brook he jumped in there and um, you know knocked Jeff Horn down twice in round 9 and that was the final round there this one um, I think Jeff Horn, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not sure if, was he down? I think he may have been down, Jeff Horn, in this one, but he definitely put Zarafa down twice um, after being knocked down, I think, Jeff Horn. So, yeah, he put him down twice. I think it was in the ninth round, and then it ended up only being a 10 rounder this time, not a 12 rounder like the other fight, and it ended up being a majority decision there over 10 rounds in favor of Jeff Horn. That one was for the WBA and WBO. Oriental and Oceana middleweight titles. So Jeff Horn is back again, that one at middleweight, strangely. Um, this one takes place later today at the York Hall in Bethnal Green. This is obviously the preview part of the show now. Let's start with the undercard. Um, Shannon Courtney, 4 0. She's in a six two minute round contest against Bushra El Quasi, who's 2 0 with two draws, actually. The Spanish. Um, the Spanish. Uh, lady from from um, Catalonia, 36 years of age. Um, also on that bill, we get to see Craig Richards, 15 and one, a late addition to the bill. He takes on Chad Sugden. Um, I think that's how I said, or Sugden. I'm not quite sure if I'm pronouncing that right. 11 and one, anyway, is he? Um, he actually had a fight lined up for two days' time. Obviously, he won't be fighting in that fight. Um, he's he's got a loss to journeyman Alistair Warren, which. You know, you kind of have to look at that and say, "Oh, that's a bit, that's a bit dodgy there." And just having a little look at it now, he's beaten two people with winning records, I believe. Yeah, and those two were his last two opponents, Farouk Daku and Luke Blackledge. He beat them both on points over eight rounds. I'm obviously expecting Craig Richards to have way too much for his opponent here. Um, also on the card, we get to see Kieran Conway, 13-1 and one with one draw. He's in a 10-rounder against Craig O'Brien, 11-1. and one. That one should be quite interesting there. Obviously, O'Brien lost his O to Anthony Fowler, and Kieran Conway lost his O in that very venue to Ted Cheeseman. That could be a good fight there over 10 rounds. Lufa Clay, though, 12-1. and one. He takes on Freddie Kiewit, 17-2. and two. I actually like both guys in that one there. Um, Freddie Kiewit, a good fighter. He's, he's I believe gone on the road a couple times um it's a funny one because he was born in liberia he lives in london and he's down as a german native so he's one of those guys quite quite traveled but um you know luther clay hearing that he's all the goods from a lot of people and he's been impressive lately i think his last fight was on that italian matchroom card so all the best to him as well and topping the bill the best fight on the card richard Riakpour, 10 and 0 um he takes on jack massey 16 and 0 this one's for the vacant british cruiserweight title um Richard Riatpool, you know, he's been looking real good, obviously. The win last time out against Chris Billum Smith was a great, great fight, actually. A really great fight. And the fight before that against Tommy McCarthy, where he stopped him. So he's on a bit of a run now, Richard Riatpool. Jack Massey, um, I, I want him to do well, you know, because Jack Massey went in for the handshake at the press conference, I think it was, and Riatpool just blanked him, completely didn't shake his hand, and 
whenever that kind of thing happens, I think, all right, I want the, uh, you know, the, the the guy that didn't get his hand shook to do well. But all the pettiness aside, Richard Riakpour is probably a bit too good, and I'm expecting him to prove it here once again. So that one will be interesting later today. Um, probably you've probably seen it actually by the time you listen to the podcast. But moving on to what's on tomorrow at the Talking Stick Resort Arena in Phoenix, Arizona, USA, over here. Our very own Josh Kelly, 9-0 with a draw. He returns to the U.S. He's in a 10-rounder against Winston Campos, 31-6 with six draws. Um, Winston Campos, I've definitely seen that name before. I think he's mixed it with a few guys. Just going to have a quick little look at the record. Um, He's been in there with Josh Taylor, got stopped in three rounds. He's been in there with Ishmael Barroso, got stopped in four. Yeah, I must must have remembered him from the Josh Taylor fight. But yeah, um, a Nicaraguan fighter there. For Josh Kelly. Uh, also on the bill, Daniel Yelusinov, 8 0. He's in a 10 rounder against Alan Sanchez, 20 and 4 with a draw. Um, also on the bill, we have Liam Smith, 28 and 2 with a draw. He takes on Roberto Garcia, 42 and 4. I haven't seen Garcia fight since he lost to Martin Murray. I think that one was that one at the Copper Box, if I remember correctly. It might have been somewhere else in London, actually. I think it was in London. Um, it was on an undercard of something. I think I remember going to the um, the press conference for that one. I might have even been at that fight. Um, yeah, I think I was actually. But anyways, anyways, um, yeah, I think Liam Smith's gonna gonna be way too good actually for Roberto Garcia. Don't really rate him that much. Quite an inflated record, like I say. Also on the bill, former WBO world champion, twenty six and one with three draws. Maurice Hooker. He's in a ten rounder against Uriel Perez, who's. 19 and 4, but he's got 17 KOs, so quite a heavy handed fight at a 24 year old Mexican. He's been in there with a couple of guys, though, that have beaten him that don't really have the big names. So, um, yeah, you're, you're expecting Maurice Hooker to have too much there. That one is to happen at super lightweight. For some reason, I thought Maurice Hooker might have moved up. Um, Daniel Jacobs, 35 and 3, takes on Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., 51 and 3, with a draw over 12 rounds. Again, I as it's a it's a fight where, you know, it's not it's not the blockbuster fight like Eddie Hearn described it originally. He said we're going to be announcing a blockbuster fight. I think the card's quite good, but this fight in particular, I'm not really that bothered about it. You know, um, Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. Obviously, a real tough guy, got a great chin. Um, you know, had a people say he had a war with with Canelo but he didn't really have a war he got completely beaten to to a pulp really and I was quite surprised he even had a fight after that I thought that would be it for him I thought he got a big payday for that but no he's back against Daniel Jacobs and Daniel Jacobs for me will have too much for him I can see Daniel Jacobs probably going the distance though because he is a tough guy Chavez Um, also on the bill Julio Cesar Martinez Aguilar um, obviously the former opponent of Charlie Edwards it's been a strange ride for him he won the fight for about two minutes and then it obviously got called a no contest he didn't get the belt but he fights here for it the the vacant WBC world flyweight title he's also been popped for um, was it Clem Butera I think but then the WBC defended him and said that they think he probably ate some contaminated Mexican meat but anyway he's 14 and 1 he takes on former holder of the belt Christopher Rosales who's actually the guy that Charlie Edwards beat for the title again Christopher Rosales a guy that we know very well he's been over here to Britain a, a few times he boxed obviously Charlie Edwards I think that was on the Dillian White and Derek Chisora two undercard he boxed um, Cal Yafai and he boxed um Someone else as well. Uh, Andrew Selby. Andrew yeah, Selby. Yeah, that was it. He had Selby on the deck in the first round, didn't he? Um, and Rosales, I think, yeah, he beat Paddy Barnes, didn't he? So, yeah, he's, you know, we know him over here, the British and Irish fans. Um, should be a good fight, though, because Rosales is absolutely massive for flyweight, and he's a, you know, he's a big puncher. He's a tough guy. I don't think he's been stopped in his losses. So, it'd be interesting, because obviously Aguilar, very small guy, but, you know, he, he carries some serious power in those fists. So, I'm really looking forward to that one. And all, and all, um, an all-Latino war, that one will be. Moving out now, though, to Australia at the Entertainment Centre in Hurstville, New South Wales. Former world champion Billy Dibb, friend of the show, 45-6. and six. He's in a 10-rounder against Van Tram, who's 12-0. and 0. He's a bit of a prospect. That one could be interesting. I'm very surprised, actually, to see Billy Dibb back in a ring. I mean, he retired after losing to Tevin Farmer. Then he bounced back... Um, 
I think with a win against the journeyman. Then he got the big fight in Saudi against Damir Khan when he was a late replacement. I thought that the payment he got for that fight would make him sail off into the sunset because he got that last payday. But no, he's back. And he's back against the prospect. So it's a crossroads fight there. Uh, moving out to Germany. This one taking place in Hamburg. We've got Jürgen Bremer, 30... Oh, sorry, 30. What am I talking about? 51 and 3. He fights for the IBF Intercontinental Super Middleweight title against Jürgen Doberstein, who is 25 and 3 with a draw. Um, that's really it for that one. Moving out now to Russia at the Ivan Yarijin Sports Palace. Over here, a good, good fight. Denis Lebedev, 32 and 2. He takes on Tabiso Machunu, 21 and 5. That one's for the vacant WBC Silver Cruiserweight title. On the undercard, he's back. The Russian hammer, Dmitry Kudryashov, 23 and 3. He's in a 10 rounder against Vaklav Pejar, who is 14 and 8. Um, Dmitry Kudryashov, one of my favorite fighters to watch. He either gets knocked out or knocks you out. I love fighters like that. And he's got a great beard. I love it. I'm not talking about his chin. I'm talking about the actual beard. It's a, it's a Viking-like beard. Um, also on the same evening, but taking place at the Copper Box Arena in London. Over here we get to see Daniel Dubois, 13-0. and 0. He tops the bill over 12 rounds against Kayataro Fujimoto, 21-1. and 1. That one's for the vacant WBC Silver Heavyweight title and the WBO International Heavyweight title. Um, Fujimoto, I mean... 21 and 1, the record, 33 years of age. He's only 6 foot, so he's given away a lot of height there. Um, I saw him at the at the open workout. He's got a very, very big head, very, very, very big face. I feel like Daniel Dubois is going to, um, you know, get him out of there pretty, pretty early, to be honest. Um, one very interesting thing is that he actually boxed a guy, um, Nobuhiro Ishida. He boxed this guy. This guy was actually a 154 fighter. Can you believe that? He was a 154 fighter. He moved up to heavyweight. And um, this guy here, Fujimoto, beat him. A 154 fighter. He moved up to heavyweight. And Fujimoto beat him on a split decision over 12 rounds. Uh, sorry, 10 rounds. So that's that tells me all I need to know. I don't think he's going to you know, be able to fret or put up any kind of threat to Daniel Dubois. Daniel Dubois should handle him quite easily. Um, also on that card, though, we get to see a brilliant fight between Liam Williams, 21-2 and two with a draw. He takes on friend of the show, Alontes Fox, 26-1 and one with a draw. Both men actually friends of the show. Um, that's over 12 rounds. The winner of that, I believe, gets to face Demetrius Andrade at some point in 2020. So best of luck there to both men. Uh, Sonny Edwards fights for the vacant British super flyweight title, 13-0, and former friend of the show. Um, he takes on Marcel Braithwaite. There's a bit of black. Bad blood, bad blood. Um, Marcel Braithwaite obviously got that one loss to Brett Fido. That doesn't look good on his record. And other than that, when you look down it, he hasn't beaten anyone with a winning record. So I'm not quite sure. Um, I'm not quite sure. You know, it's interesting from the trash talking point of view, but I don't think he's going to be able to cause Edwards any problems. Edwards, a fantastic fighter. Lucian Reed on the bill as well, eight and zero with two draws. He's in a six rounder against Stefan Nikolai, who. Um, who boxed Liam Davies on an undercard, I think it was last week, or, or at least at least in the month of December for sure. Um, also on the bill, obviously, Tommy Fury 2-0, no, no opponent just yet for him. And Archie Sharp is also on the bill. He boxes um, a guy called... A guy called... Are Tom's Remlavs? I think the guy is eleven and zero, if I'm not mistaken, with with a couple of KOs. Let me just double check that because it's, it's still not still not listed online. But I know that the fight's taking place. Let me just get the spelling of that. Art John's Remlavs. Yeah, he's eleven and zero with six KOs from Latvia. Um, it's not listed at all online, but it is actually taking place. So. All the best to Archie Sharp, obviously, friend of the show. Hopefully he moves to 18-0. and 0. Moving out now to the States. This is the final card to mention. It takes place on Fox Sports 1. Let's start with the undercard. Andre Durrell, friend of the show, 26 and... F oh, no, he's not a friend of the show. Anthony Durrell's a friend of the show. Uh, Andre Durrell, 26 and 3. He's in a 10-rounder against Juan Cabrera, who's 24 and 2. Effia Jagba, the heavyweight prospect from Nigeria, 11 and 0. He takes on Iago Kiladzi, former opponent of Joe Joyce and Michael Hunter. Um, 
26 and 4 with a draw, Kiladzi. That's over 10 rounds. Good good measuring stick kind of fight, I suppose, that one for a Jagba. Um, and topping the bill, Tony Harrison, 28 and 2, 12 round contest against Jamel Charlo. It's the rematch, I as. Obviously, Harrison was able to win on points in the first fight. It's for his WBC World Super Welterweight title. How do you see it unfolding, though? Because it seems like Tony Harrison, since that fight, has, has, has really mastered getting under the, the skin of Jamel Charlo. Uh, if I'm, um, this is going to be a very good fight. But if I'm going to go with a win, I'm going to go with Jamel Charlo to get the revenge win by points. Do you know what? Um, Tony Harrison's a friend of the show, but I have to say I, I agree. You know, I think Jamel Charlo was was um, it was on that same that same night where his brother Jamal boxed uh, Matty Korobov, and both Charlos just didn't really look right that that night there. And Tony Harrison had a good night. It was still close on the cards. You know, it was still close. A lot of people online thought that Charlo won. I just think even though. You know, Harrison's been able to get under his skin, which he clearly has, actually. He's doing a fantastic job of getting under Jamel Charlo's skin. Um, I think he should keep it up. Um, but it's going to be interesting. It's it's made the, the rematch here um, a lot kind of more highly anticipated than the first one. So I'm looking forward to this a lot more than I, than I was the first one. Um, all the best to Harrison. I'd like to see him actually win the fight, but I just think Jamel Charlo is going to train a little bit harder. Um, you know, he's going he's gonna to be more on his game, and I think a, hundred, a, a 100% Jamel Charlo beats a 100% Tony Harrison. So I think if Charlo doesn't let the mind games get to him, then he should, he should prevail. But listen, I've been wrong countless times i've lost count actually but that is everything though for the preview part of the show just before we wrap up the show entirely the final thing to do is to welcome our second and final guest ladies and gentlemen please welcome the former ibf lightweight world champion it is of course mr mickey bay mickey welcome to the show uh thanks for having me my pleasure my friend my pleasure so so mickey i mean i want to touch on a couple of things obviously you know, you made your pro your pro debut all the way back in 2005, and as far as careers go, you haven't exactly had the easiest journey. But um, let's let's start on a positive. Let's start on a positive. September 13th, 2014. Some remember it for being the May the Mayweather Maidana rematch, but of course, on that undercard, Mickey Bay, Miguel Vasquez for the IBF lightweight world title taught me through that that night. A night I know you'll never forget, Mickey. Oh yeah, yeah, that was a good night. Um... Yeah, where I captured the title and uh, beat a real good opponent, real awkward opponent uh, on on the big stage too. So yeah, that was a good day. And what did it what did it mean to you to become world champion, Mickey? I mean, obviously, it's every it's every kid's dream when they when they turn to boxing. I like to ask that question because I hear a variation of answers when I ask it. <laughs> um, well, that's like the pinnacle. So you know, that's what every fighter. Even fighters, you know, many people don't get there. So that's what you always work towards. Um, so, you know, it was it was uh, a real good feeling, you know. But uh, like you said, I wanted to keep it going. But, you know, I had to get hand surgery after the fight because I actually went into the fight. Um, I had hand problems for some years. And uh, I actually fought, you know, pretty much with one hand. People didn't know, but. After I won the title, I got hand surgery. Um, had a little managerial problems from then uh, for a little minute, and that's kind of why I had been off. Yeah, because you know you you obviously didn't get to defend the title. It was quite a messy situation. I think Denis Shafikov, uh, a fight that was supposed to happen but didn't end up happening, and then obviously I'm not sure what happened. Did you did you vacate or did they strip you? What what actually happened from your point of view? Yeah, well I vacated because I wasn't ready to fight. My manager had made the fight without my permission at the time because we had an agreement set in place that that he told me about uh, behind closed doors that, that never went into effect. So um, so really it was a matter of, you know, I was probably only 50% into my healing with my hand and my manager made the fight too soon. So I ended up having to vacate it because, you know, it's like a deadline. We would have had more time, but my manager at the time, he made, um, you know, he pretty much, signed off on everything to get going so since uh by that happening you know they had to let somebody else fight for the belt 
And, you know, back at that time, obviously, promotional-wise, you were signed to Mayweather Promotions. Um, I'm guessing you were one of their first world champions, I'd say? Yeah, I was one. I think Ishay might have got it right before me. Okay, okay. And Yeah, Ishay Smith. Yeah, yeah, friend of the show, Ishay. And obviously, you know, back at that time, everything was going well. What what actually happened, Mickey, for this, this arrangement, this, this deal, to just end what seemed so kind of sourly, you know, like there, there seemed like there was a big miscommunication, I don't think you were happy, why did things break down like that? Uh, I just think at the time, like, um, you know, my relationship was always great with Floyd and even, you know, his family, because I pretty much started out with him, you know, I was training with his dad and I knew his family for a very long time, you know, like over 15 years now, um, but uh, I just think it was a matter of my manager was young and he never managed before and he was inexperienced. So it was just things that was happening. You know, I just don't think he was ready to manage like a fighter that was up on the championship caliber as his first cast because he'd never been in the business. And he was, you know, he was young. He was only a couple years older than me and never really dealt in business at all, let alone um, in the boxing business. So, you know, I just think it was a lot of mistakes made. It was, you know, just kind of messy. Cause, you know, he was Floyd's family member, so it was just kind of messy. Uh, I'll just kind of sum it up at that. Yeah. And, I mean, you did you did end up getting a shot at the IBF title once again when you boxed uh, Rancis Barthelemy in 2016. And there were some, right. there were some very different scorecards on the night. I mean, you lost by a split decision, but one judge had it to you, 117-110. Right. Right. The other two judges had it 117-110 right. the other way, and obviously 111-116. Despite you right. dropping him in the second round, um, how did you feel right. you got on that night there? Um, well, uh, that fight... Um... I think it was a little too short a notice at uh, at that time. You know, I think I had like a four week notice or something like that. That's kind of short for a title fight. Definitely. But nevertheless, it was still a great fight. Like, um, you know, he's a, a a real good fighter and was you know real awkward and everything. Um, we pretty much fought him in his backyard at that time in Miami. But it was still a good fight. You know. Um, I like to take on challenges no matter what. So even though I got the shot, I knew it wasn't, you know, enough time to have a camp or anything. But um, I pretty much, you know, just went in, just fought off heart, just what I had at the time. And, you know, um, and that's what happened. And then, obviously, after that fight, that's where you became massively inactive. Um, you were you were out the right. ring for 27 months. Um, what again? What caused that layoff, or was that still managerial issues? Yeah, yeah, it was a managerial issue. Um, um you know that pretty much uh, derailed things for a minute. You know, because I'm the kind of guy that, you know, I don't. You would think like, okay, what is he doing? He might be BS and partying, or like, but I don't. You know, I'm a real dedicated person. Like, just period. Like, just, you know, I don't really do. I'm not a wild guy at all, so, you know, I was always ready to fight, and I, it's like, it was just that, you know, like we said, it was a managerial thing, so it was like, you know, without without trying to dig it all the way up and say something bad about, you know, the cat, it was just like, man, I'm going to teach him a lesson, kind of one of those kind of things, like, you know, so, you know, I'm going to teach him a lesson, and and, and show them that self, everything should be my way or you won't fight at all. It was kind of one of those things. But what he really like the actual promotional company, like Floyd and Leonard, it was straight, but it was just like, you know, Floyd is busy. He doesn't even really know what's going on with the company because yeah, it's just under his name. So he, like, you know, it was just a little messy, uh, and I'm just glad the time did fly by. And actually, I'm with my advisor now, who um, he kind of sensed, like, man, you know, that I should be gone and, and stuff should be better. So we saw each other in um, Las Vegas, and, uh, you know, we hooked up ever since then. You know, Andre Rose here. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we actually together now. And, um, you know, he got me back on track. Uh 
couldn't even get any easy fights. You know, nobody still wanted to fight us, even though we've been off so many years. And that's why we did take this hard fight coming back. Um, but now we're getting ready to get rolling. You know, uh, he's going to keep me busy, and we're going to definitely get back to the top. I mean, we almost just did it despite the layoff. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously you had you had the twenty the twenty seven month layoff thing. You boxed, um, you come back for one fight, Luis Valdivia. Um, you know, you, obviously you beat him, and then and then yeah, you disappeared for another fifteen months before Saturday night. And you know, going into that fight there, I mean, this this guy George Cambosos Junior. Obviously, we're hearing a lot of good things. A, a Manny Pacquiao sparring partner, a guy that's undefeated. Um, Right. Just, just actually analysing the fight itself, I mean, it's clear to see, and I'm not trying to make an excuse for you at all, but it's clear to see that coming off like that much inactivity, I think you had one fight in three and a half years, surely the preparation right. wasn't great going into that, and it was still a split decision, a close fight, where a knockdown in the last round seemed to play a big part in the fight. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, like I say, I, um, I mean, that was, uh, it was a tall task. I still think, you know, without that kind of mistake, you know, that I made in the last round, and it, you know, it was kind of weird. But I saw that, okay, I still got it, and I was sharp. I felt good. Camp was, it was, I had a real camp this time. Everything was great. So, you know, um, I'm just really excited to get back in, just seeing that I still was pretty sharp to be off that long from fighting it. You know, it's different still from the gym and stuff. You got to see if you got it still. And against, a, you know, a top opponent like that, you know, and a younger opponent like that, um, it just makes the – I'm just even more excited to get back in next. When I get back in next, it's going to be uh, even a different ball. The ball game is going to be so much different because I got my rust off with a top opponent. So, so now I'm ready to really go for it. And coming down to the last few questions now, Mickey, um, I wanted to ask, what is the relationship like now, you know, personally with, with, with Floyd? Obviously, you know, a lot of his fighters have said good things about him. You mentioned there, Ishe Smith, you know, Badu, Jack, Ashley, Fiafain, guys like that have all been on this show before, and they all have high praise. Are, are you and Floyd good now? Yeah, I mean, it, it was never really, like I say, it wasn't really a thing with us. I mean, I was disappointed the way that he let things happen yeah. because he's a fighter and he kind of knows how it is. Like, you know, um, but yeah, but as far as overall, I learned a lot from him, like as far as boxing and he done a lot of great things for me. So, um, I won't just let certain things that didn't go good, just tarnish everything. You know, I saw him not too long ago, you know, everything is cool. Like, but, I just wish stuff would have turned out, you know, different. As far as who who was in the middle, it's not even really him. Him and Leonard, I think if I had a middle person, it would have been great. Like, say I had my advisor I got now, if Andre was in the middle, oh, it would have been like, I mean, like through the roof. But like I say, I had a, at the time, I had a guy that was inexperienced and, you know, um, it was more like a, it was more like him practicing, learning how to manage, and I don't think that at that stage in my career that wasn't a good thing because a lot of mistakes was made. I had to be kind of the fall guy for everything. And, you know, I'm the kind of guy who wasn't coming out in the media saying anything, but reports that get put out, like, oh, he turned down this amount of money, That wasn't none of that stuff was true. Like, so that was the only thing that kind of disappointed me. Yeah, that does seem a great shame because, like I say, and you you said it yourself, you know, you were right up there, championship level, and then um, exactly, and then all these mistakes. It was came time into, to take exactly, off. Exactly, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and 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 that and that yeah, exactly. So that was the the part when you get to that point, it's time to make some money. But it was like, man, just those couple mistakes, and my manager kind of rushing and. You know, just not being transparent, it kind of messed that kind of stuff up. And from there, everybody knows that work around Floyd that you, you can't do that kind of stuff or, with him because the way that he thinks his stuff will go bad. So I'll just, you know, kind of leave it at that. Yeah, for sure. 
And I want to ask you, Mickey, um, what is next for you? What do you want to do next? Obviously, you mentioned you you knocked the the rust off against a good opponent. What do you want to do next? I'm talking like your your very next fight. Um. Well, what what, what my advisor got planned for me is because I don't know a lot of people didn't know, but I was like pretty much like really I I kind of always fought in between junior lightweight and lightweight, but. The reason why I stayed at lightweight was because I got the title shot there first, but his idea was to put me back at junior lightweight because I always weigh in at well below the lightweight limit like I did this fight. You know, I pretty much weighed in at almost junior lightweight and uh, pretty and naturally. So um, we, it's possible that we can get a shot there. So, you know, I would like to fight get the biggest fight possible there, you know, something that will get me towards the title or any big fight. Okay, that sounds interesting. I like I like the idea of that, actually. that's I like that one. I like that one. Good advising. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Oh, you do? <laughs> uh, well, uh, what would you like to see there? Like what? <laughs> mm, there's, a, there's a lot of guys that are kind of in the top 10 rankings with the sanctioning bodies that you could fight. Um Right. And that would, you know, get you ranked pretty quickly. I like a lot of fights there. Right. If you, you know, w- when we're done speaking, just check out the rankings there because there's some real right. winnable fights for you there, and you get ranked pretty quickly, in my opinion. You know. Right, right, and that, and that's the goal. Like, um, is to, you know, and I'm sure that's what we will do, and, and it'll be soon. The good, uh, the good thing is that I didn't take any punishment. I'm good. I'm actually on the way to the gym now just to kind of shake out a little bit. You know, my hands don't hurt, um, and I feel great. Like, I'm I'm pretty much healed up already from the fight, and that was a 10-round, you know, competitive fight. Uh, but I was in great shape. Like, if I had um, the camp that I just had for this fight, I, I, I wouldn't have a loss in my career. You know, I would have had one. I wouldn't have had that one or two losses that I had, definitely. And this question here, I'm asking to everyone that I'm speaking to in the month of December, Mickey. I want to ask, what's on your Christmas wish list in terms of your career um, for 2020? So where can you be in a realistic world this time next year? Um, On behalf of you, I want to say I just want to see you active. That's my wish list. I want to see you active. Right. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's really it. Like That and being the champion. Uh, And I'm sure we'll achieve it. Um, that being the champion and going into, you know, the following year, getting a couple big wins and, and maybe go out on top. Um, you know, as a fighter, since I'm healthy, I take care of myself. I haven't taken a lot of punishment, so I don't really fight or look. What you would say is kind of a fighter that's getting a little older. Um, I don't really feel it. So, you know, I'm just glad and, and I'm blessed that I've, still got the reflexes, the energy and all of that. Um but yeah, we're gonna go on a real strong run and, and end it off on top. I really do like the sound of that, my friend. And this question here I like to ask to everyone that we speak to from overseas, Mickey. Um who comes to mind I'm putting you on the spot a little bit here, but who comes to mind when I ask who's your favorite UK fighter? of all time. It can be a guy that's still boxing today. It can be Anthony Joshua if you wanted. It can be a guy that retired oh, years okay. ago. That's a good that's a good question, man. <laughs> I, for some reason I was thinking about that uh not too long ago. I, I asked myself that. I said, man, who and I I got a few. Can I name more than of one? Of course you can. You're Mickey Bay. <laughs> okay, I like um see I like a lot of real old school fighters. So one is uh Randy Turson. Okay. Yeah, that's one. Um, I liked uh, Kalzaki. Oh, for sure. Let me see right now. Right now, I like uh, Fury. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like Fury. Um, I want to make sure because I, as soon as we hang up, I'm end up thinking of a bunch of people. Because <laughs> I was watching some old school guys that I like. That's why I brought up Randy Turpin because I was watching him, and he was real good. Um, I like um. I used to like, um, you know what? You know who was pretty good that that people don't. I, I think that to me, the Carl Fox was a real good fighter. Yeah, 
We get him sometimes when I yeah, ask he, that question, yeah. Yeah, like he was he was a good fighter, like, you know, he was a real good fighter, Carl Frotch. Um right now, uh, I kinda like um I think Fury Mike Fury, um oh oh, Josh Taylor. Oh yeah. He's from there too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scotland, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, I like him. Uh, then you got guys, you know, you got guys like Frampton. It's a lot of it's some man, it's a lot of good skilled fighters over there. Yeah, man, there there there's some good names there. I mean, obviously, uh, yeah, like even even when you look at Nigel Ben and and, and guys like that, Chris Eubanks. <laughs> um, you know, I like a lot of those guys, like a lot of the old school cats too. Prince Nassim Hamed. Oh man, definitely. Because I I sparred with him before. Oh my man, god! Tell me about that. Wow. Yeah. When I was little, I was a kid. I used to train. I was uh, I used to be a part of the crunk team with Emmanuel Stewart. Mm-hmm. So I um, Lennox Lewis too. See, I almost forgot. <laughs> I was going to tell you that one next. <laughs> yeah, I used to work out. I used to work out with Lennox and uh, Prince Isaiah. Wow. Yup. So yeah, I got a chance to move around with Prince uh, when I was younger. So yeah, definitely those two, man. I forgot. Like, yeah, that was definitely at the top. <laughs> um, Lenny Lewis and Prince Nazim for sure. Okay. I even I like Ricky Hatton too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone says him. Yeah, as I well. like Ricky Hatton. All right. Well, congrats on naming. Yeah, Ricky con- was a beast. Congrats on naming the most British fighters. You knew more than what I thought, to be honest. <laughs> oh, when I hang up, I'm a, I'm a, I forgot you, a you, lot. Believe it's cool. You you can text me the you know, rest. I, um, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, because I like a lot of the old school guys. Randy Turpin was just one that stuck out. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because you know he was real good and he was crafty. But I guarantee you, I'm gonna remember some more uh, throughout your day. <laughs> All right, my friend. And just finally, um, if you've got any closing words, just to our listeners, obviously we're UK based. I'm sure you've you've probably had lots of love from the UK. They really recognise real fighters, and obviously you know you'll have a fan base over here. What's your message to your supporters from this side of the um, ocean? Well, I want to thank everybody from the UK, and hopefully I come over there and fight soon. Actually, let me add that to my list for 2020 to get a uh, big fight in the UK. I think that I think the UK got the best and most loyal um, boxing fans in the world. Like, so I would love to come over there and fight. So let's add that to the Christmas list. Um, me coming to the UK uh, and and coming over there to fight. You know, that, that's on the list, as a matter of fact. We definitely welcome you over here with open arms, Mickey. But listen, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you this week. Have a fantastic Christmas and a happy new year. And I'm sure that we'll catch up some at some at some point in 2020. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, happy holidays. I'll talk to you again soon. Okay, and this wraps up episode 218 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. I as Sumra has been I as Sumra. A massive thank you to our two guests on this week's show, the ultimate boxer heavyweight champion, Nick Webb, and the former IBF lightweight world champion, Mickey Bay. Uh, no predictions again this week. No further news to mention. I do just want to thank you all, though, for listening once again to this week's podcast. This is also the last podcast before Christmas, so I'd like to take this moment here to wish you all a very, very Merry Christmas. Remember to look out for our Christmas special podcast that will be dropping on Boxing Day. Hopefully that one will feature a couple of unexpected guests for you all to hear. But that is everything from myself. Remember to tell a friend to tell a friend and tell them to tell their friends. We shall see you all again next week.